morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Thank you for joining us this Paki Market Monday. My name is Sabin Joroge, and with me, I have two lovely gentlemen. They are joining us again. We have Reverend Ambrose Nyangao, Senior Pastor of Parkland Baptist Church. Welcome, Pastor. Thank you. And we have Dr. Julius <coughs> Muya, uh, Principal Secretary of National Treasury. Thank Karibu you. Sada, Daktari. You just read the budget. Uh, your boss read the budget a few days ago. We'll be talking about that. If you are watching us, please type. We are watching us from where. Uh, if you want to like this page, hit the wow button, hit the like button. Uh, we'll be sharing with you also a workbook of our discussion here. So click the parky virtualchurch.org and you'll get the workbook and the recording. Gentlemen, Karibuni Sara, introductory words from you, Daktari. Well, first of all is to say thank you for this invite and um, I greet everyone who is uh, watching this show and appreciate the opportunity to share about um, the opportunities that uh, are coming up in business mm -hmm. uh, as we go through the COVID and we uh, go post-COVID period. And uh, we look forward to an entertaining and exciting show. Karibu, Karibu. <coughs> it will be an exciting time. I'm, I'm, I'm sure about it. Pastor, yes. welcome. Thank you. It's a joy to be on this platform. Uh, just to be able to encourage us because I know that we are living in a very interesting season. Uh, but it's a season full of opportunities. A season full of hope. And I believe in heaven, as we share, uh, that will begin to come out. And we just want to tell those of us who are listening... Just be encouraged because something good is on the way. Amen, amen. If you have a pen, please grab a pen, please grab a paper. Today we'll be talking about the future of business sustaining, the future of business creating possibility. I beg your pardon. The future of business creating possibility. So I know the church is also a business, kingdom business, so we'll talk about that. And also in the backdrop of having a budget, we'll also talk about the implication of that budget for the business men and women here. So I'll start with you, Dr. Uh, it, we had the Great Depression. And, and at the backdrop of the Great Depression, we had uh, uh, big companies that came. We had Disney and we had General Electric. And then a few years ago, we had the Great Recession. And that was the launch of the gig economy. We had Uber, we had uh, Airbnb. We in the post-COVID. Uh, do, you, do you foresee a big, a big industry coming? Well, well, thank you, Pastor. I will first of all start with um, actually the COVID season because yes. um, at this time we are battling through yes. the COVID. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then after that, of course, we are hoping to reach the post-COVID season. The post-COVID. So, so to start with initially, we have the health challenge that uh, COVID has uh, presented to us. And of course, it has presented the economic challenges that we have and a lot of other related um, logistical challenges and so on and so forth. But having said that, uh, what we are observing is that um, people, communities, uh, institutions are thinking through and asking themselves, what is the new norm mm. post-COVID? Mm. What is the post-COVID uh, environment likely to be? And what lessons can we learn and draw from this COVID challenge that we did not imagine mm. it would happen? Mm. And so uh, what is coming out in the horizon is the potential for technology to play a very, very big part mm. in our lives. Mm. And when I say our lives, that extends to our businesses, mm. it extends to our relationships, it extends to what government does. It extends to what economies do. And so we see technology as a big enabler and a big differentiator mm. in terms of uh, what kind of businesses people will do and what businesses will thrive. But then again, uh, you know, when you talk about business again, it also relates to what do consumers want? Because mm. the consumer is the king. Yes. We say... Customer the, is the king. The, yeah, yeah. The customer is the king he orders. Yes. Or she orders, depending on how you want to look <laughs> at gender. And, and therefore, the post-COVID uh, period is going to see a reshaped demand pattern mm. where people, institutions, will be looking for goods and services that satisfy a different set of needs. And some of the needs that you are seeing coming are the needs for people to be very careful and conscious about their health. Mm. And, and therefore, you will see a lot of push towards health-related technology wow. reforms. Wow. 
uh, health related technology shifts and, and, and you know a lot of um, application of technology to help people do things better mm. in a more hygienic way and mm. uh, not having to <coughs> expose themselves to dangers of mm. uh, health uh, kind of like contracting <coughs> uh, wrong diseases and so if, if I can also stretch that to the challenge of interrelationships and interdependence mm. one would see a situation where communities economies are going to look to be as self-sufficient as possible mm. because this covid has taught us a very nasty lesson mm -hmm. that you could have the money but then the goods and the services are not there because of the closed borders because of the closed borders <clears throat> and so i think a big lesson is um, economies businesses communities are going to look to be as self-sufficient as possible mm. and so for us from a business point of view i am looking at the opportunities then that uh, are going to arise from the point of view that communities and economies are going to look to be as independent as self-sufficient as possible okay of course technology being a major driver a major enabler a major enabler yeah in that, in that. pastor yes. uh, the church <coughs> is a business uh, it's a it's a it's a kingdom business from, from, from the first century church, you, you see how the churches started with the persecution of the Christians and how it grew from, from house groups or from small groups. Here, in Paiki, we call them house groups. Yes. And now in the 1500s, we had the, the cathedrals, the big cathedrals. Uh, and now, and actually most churches are, 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 are taking their building structures from the cathedrals. So we have still big churches 10,000 seater churches now post covid even during covid the church has been empty we are just using these cameras to broadcast how or where do you see the church moving forward well one good thing is to know that the bible says jesus actually said i will build my church mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the gates of hell will not prevail against it mm -hmm. And so Jesus is still building his church. And the church is not stone and mortar. Mm. Church is people. Mm. And I believe during this season, one of the lessons of what we have also learned is that people are important. Mm. And that we have been reduced to the basic things of life. Mm. Um, and so where the church is going right now is to be able to begin to realize that there are certain things we really don't need. And uh, there's a way we still can fellowship we can communicate we can embrace people uh, the ps has talked about technology yes and we believe that technology is going to again play a big role mm. even within the church setup mm. um, though people would like to come together hug mm. each other uh, greet each other <laughs> but we're reaching a stage we're greeting like this <laughs> yes we're reaching a stage when we begin to realize that we still are able to reach each other even through technology but still communicate the love of God communicate the goodness of God and touch more people that we have ever touched mm. in this season and in this, in this season so the shift is from brick and mortar to people yes and enabling technology going to the virtual space exactly and I must congratulate <coughs> you for leading us in this season and going online so thank you pastor for thank that mm. what appears uh, we want to talk about reopening I know the government of the world has started reopening, case in point China, and they're using clever things, using technology. Mm -hmm. And what I read uh, recently was they're using QR codes to put on people's phone. Uh, if you go into the red zone, uh, they'll send a signal to them and say, hey, Dr. Muya has gone to a place which is not very conducive for his health. And we are seeing also the development of the 3D printing as we reopen. How do you foresee that? We hope we'll reopen, actually. <laughs> we had a false reopening a few weeks ago. We hope we'll reopen. What are the implications for the business people? Uh, thank you, Pastor. Let me just step back a bit yes. and um, recap on something that I can connect with also technology. That when you look at the level at which we are able to share information mm. using WhatsApp, using um, our videos using our computers there is so much information that been shared about this COVID mm. that previously in what we were talking about the depression and the recession that information was not shared yes. so we are in a space where 
the protocols that different countries are using to deal with the pandemic mm. are quickly being rolled out and shared mm. among many countries. Mm. So in our case, for instance, we are watching the protocols that are being advised by World Health Organization. We are looking at the protocols being advised by African Union in mm. terms of the economies opening up. What are the basics and bare minimums that you should observe? Mm. We are also looking at other countries that have opened. What protocols have they come up with? You know, in terms of um, children going to school, mm. what space mm. are they likely uh, to need? Like, mm. for instance, if a class had 50 students, you can you accommodate 50 students in one classroom mm. and observe social distance? Mm. And the answer is no. So we are likely now to have a situation where we will have classrooms that will have fewer children. Mm. Now, if then you have fewer children in a classroom and you don't have new classrooms that are built, mm -hmm. then how do you organize the academic calendar mm -hmm. so that the children and the pupils go through uh, schooling in an inter uninterrupted way? Again, of course, there is the uh, uh, hand washing and all these uh, uh, things that we are using for hygiene. To what extent then are we going to ensure that that is the practice in everyday life? such that you look at schools and you ask yourself, what kind of sanitary arrangements are we going to make available to the children mm. so that there's water mm. to wash their hands as they play around? Mm. Um, there are other uh, facilities that we're talking about, hygiene, the masks. I mean, I'm seeing a situation where going forward, you'll be seeing people wearing masks more often. It will not be unique and uh, unusual to see mm. people wearing face masks mm. because uh, it has been proven that uh, the face masks are very good in terms of prevention mm. of uh, you know of uh, contracting and uh, you know being infected by the disease and so those changed habits that um, we have seen in other countries and also we are enforcing they are going to form part of the protocols that will be the bare minimums. In a restaurant, for example, mm. Mm. how <coughs> far or how close will you, will you be allowed to sit next mm. to the other person? Mm. Um, in, at, in a hotel with a, with a bed, what kind of arrangements are you likely to have in a, in mm. a, in a, in a hotel mm. uh, in terms of the towel that you'll use, in terms of the bed that you sleep on? I mean, what kind of mm. hygiene will the hotel have to observe mm. uh, to make sure that uh, the people who go there are properly protected. And all these things about sanitizing, yeah, because uh, there is a new uh, cliche of sanitize, sanitize, sanitize. Mm. So that then creating a demand for sanitation. So I see in terms of opening up very clear protocols that are going to be pronounced by the government. Mm. But some of those protocols, again, it is us as individuals who are mm. going to cultivate and make them our way of life, mm. our way of behavior, so that society afterwards will be different. It will not be the way <coughs> that society has been before COVID. And so uh, those are the things that um, COVID has taught us mm. in terms of realities of mm. the way we live, mm. uh, the way hygiene is observed. I mean, we have heard about mm. um, fewer people going to hospital because mm. of um, bacterial infections. Uh, why? because people are observing basic hygiene. hygiene. Mm -hmm. yeah? So in terms of the taxonomy, the, the diseases that uh, we are likely to see, it's likely to change. Where now we have got diseases that are a little bit different from the ones that we have been experiencing before mm -hmm. because of higher hygiene. Mm -hmm. And so now cultivating that and making sure that people inbuild those protocols as part of their way of life, going back to school so that people are taught, mm -hmm. they are reinforced so mm -hmm. that they can observe that as their behavior, mm -hmm. going back to the households because the first classroom is the family. Mm -hmm. So going back to households and making sure that households teach their children that behavior mm -hmm. of observing social distance, of washing hands and, you know, sanitize, sanitize, that is now what will be necessary for us to have a very good code of practice and protocols for different sectors of the economy, mm. for different um, applications where you are interacting with somebody, and including travel. I mean, mm. how um, will you be protected as you board a plane mm. and sit next to a stranger mm. that you don't know? I mean, will you be wearing a, f a face mask all the way through? Mm. Uh, will they, um, 
the plane be sanitized? Mm. I mean, how many times will it mm. be sanitized as mm. you go on a 24-hour journey? Mm. So those are new things that uh, we are having to look through. We don't have dictionaries and uh, historical records to go to. Yeah, yeah so all of us are, are, learning, are learning as, as we, we are running. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a, bit, it's a bit difficult to say that, but um, we are learning, learning as we are running. Okay, yeah. Yeah. I, will not, I will not attempt. Don't, don't, don't try, <laughs> don't, try. <laughs> don't try that. So, Dr. Yeah. you are saying <clears throat> businesses will be affected. For example, if I own a restaurant that fits 50 people, I need to scale that down. And how will I still generate income? If, if, uh, for so that, that, that will Will be a Do you know, if I can actually come in there. Yes. And I want also to ride on a comment that uh, Pastor made. Yes. That we love to look at what is basic, what is necessary. Yes. Because if you look at the structure of business, mm. you'll find that there are a lot of unnecessary overheads and costs that we incur. Mm. Because it has been the way of doing things, it has been organic. Mm. So we are going to have to be smart. If for you to break even, that is for, your, for you to be in a situation where your revenues and expenses are the same. Mm -hmm. If you needed like 100 customers to come through and eat in the hotel, and now you can only seat 50, yeah. then you will go back to re-engineer your business mm. and look at what unnecessary costs do you incur mm. that you can do away with mm. and still make money mm. with only 50 customers mm. coming through. Mm. And that is what we are looking for in terms of being productive, mm. being uh, able to be competitive, mm. and getting good productivity principles. Mm. And I say this because necessity is the mother of mm. invention. Mm. Yeah. And so this yeah. COVID is bringing us to a situation where mm. we have to reinvent a lot of things and mm. re-engineer mm. and, and get into doing things that were uncomfortable. Mm. You know, thinking about something that previously you wouldn't have worried about. Mm. But now, it is the situation where everybody has to question mm. and re-engineer and think mm. through mm. the things that we do. I think that I, one thing that comes to mind is uh, we can't escape moving our products online. Uh, we can't escape reaching the people across the world using, uh, we talked about the subscription model past time a few weeks ago, and I'll in, encourage anyone who has not watched that clip, go to parkeevirtualchurch.org. We, we, dug deep into how you can build a subscription model knowing the number of customers you have you can't all fit in in a restaurant but you can please you can still provide the services to where they are so pastor before i come to you uh, i'll talk about the church the church is reopening very soon i want to speak to that person who is uh, watching online hoping to come to church very soon how will church look like well, we <laughs> you have heard about how the hotels will look like, <coughs> the schools will look like with the social... How will church look like? Is it business as usual or something will shift? It's, it's not business as usual. And uh, what, what the PS has talked about, again, we don't live in... The church does not live in a different and world mm. with the people in the marketplace. Mm. We live in the same world. Mm. We have the same children. Yes. We have the same people. Yes. And so even as we open, church will look very different, especially in terms of us, the space we are talking about. Mm. Like he said, where you expected 100 people, now you're going to serve 50 people. Mm. How do you still serve those people and still feel you're successful? Mm. Usually churches um, feel they're successful because of numbers. Mm. And so if, if, they, if their numbers is reduced to 50, mm. they, they feel they're not reaching the world because you see, the mandate of the church is go therefore and make disciples of all, all nations. nations. Get as many people as you can. Mm. But now you're being restricted by space. Mm. And instead of getting 100, you're getting 50. Mm. And just that sense of feeling, uh, I'm, I'm not fulfilling my purpose. I believe that is something that we'll just have to change. Our mindsets really mm. uh, have been forced to change. Those who don't change their mindsets will be stuck in really places. Stuck. Yeah. One of the scriptures we started with this year was to what God said, Behold, I'm doing a, a new, new thing. Mm. Do you not perceive it? Mm. I'm making a way where there seems to be no way. Mm. So this is a season where God's people will be forced to, to think, mm. rethink and rewire themselves mm. so that they can still communicate the mm. same gospel mm. and still have an impact. Mm. Pierce also talked about a lot of things happening in the home. During this season, we have realized that mm. now we are preaching not to people in the pews, mm. but to people in their homes, mm. in their sitting rooms, in their kitchens, in their bedrooms. Mm. And 
one of the things that will really have to be pushed will be the family unit. Mm. And just for the families to begin to realize that they can actually serve God in their space mm -hmm. and not wait for a pastor to come and do certain things. Mm. One of our children's uh, pastors was asking, Ambrose, how are we going to dedicate children? Mm -hmm. Because to dedicate children, uh, you ha the pastor has to lay, lay hands, hands on them. <laughs> and there's social distance. And there's social there's no distance. And parents feel that their children are uh, undedicated. Number one, if the pastor is not present, mm. and, there is and no they have not laid hands. Now, that is a mind shift that will have to take place. Mm. And what some of the things we have to do is dedicate children through uh, Zoom, for example, mm. or, during, or in this virtual space. Mm. And, but the mindset has to change, that God is still present where we are, mm. if physically we are not present. Mm. Th that's a mind shift. Wow, wow. I'm being reminded, I read uh, uh, somewhere, the church in the UK, they're using tickets. So they give you, Ambrose, your ticket number one. This is your seat, uh, your ticket number two. Just to have that contact tracing, so that if anyone is infected, they can trace where you live. So, so, so I don't know if that will happen here, but things will change. Uh, so Daktari, as we wind up, as we wind up, we cannot escape talking about the budget. We can't, but before you do, uh, if you want this workbook, please go to www.pakivirtualchurch.org. You will get the workbook, you get everything, you get the recording here. Please click the comment. Uh, if you have any questions, please type, we will see them. But, Dr. the budget. Congratulations, first of all, for <laughs> attempting and, and being successful with a three trillion budget. I know there are many questions, so we'll have. I think we'll call you later. Let me, let me, let me, let me just do that a caveat. But budgets, does that have any implication with the future of business? Do you, do you foresee any possibilities in other sectors uh, based on how you are located the budget? Well, thank you, thank you Pastor. Um, one thing I might um, first of all clarify is that um, when you are doing a budget, it could be at a family level, it could be at an institutional level, and um, at a country level. Yes, like what you did. Like what we have just done. Yes. You've got to be live to the environment and the practicalities of the moment. Of course, as you cast your eyes to the future. Mm. And so one of the things that we have had to deal with as we are doing our budgets is to ask ourselves, where are we now? Mm. And how can we cure the challenge that we have at the moment. Mm. And if I can just paraphrase a few things, we've got a series of disasters that we have had to deal with. Mm. I mean, there's a COVID which we are still dealing with. Mm. There have been the locusts that arrived on 29th of December last year. Mm. We have had floods um, ongoing now, and they were there in December. Mm. And we had um, a very dry season, actually, where we were tracking water all over mm. the country around mm. uh, September, October last year. Mm. And so we are making that budget cognizance of those challenges. Mm. Now, with the COVID situation, we've had people rendered jobless. Mm. And people who previously had jobs, like people in the hotel industry, mm. transport travel. industry, <coughs> travel, travel logistics. And actually, agricultural sector, because um, some of the agricultural produce, like mm. uh, flowers, flowers yes. yeah, we export them to Europe and many other countries. Mm. Now, if demand is not there, mm. then you will not then be able to produce the flowers, or you produce them and throw them away. Mm. Mm. So we also have to deal with a new crop of unemployed Kenyans. And these are citizens, and our government has responsibility over its people. Mm. And so this now a challenge that um, is with us um, has given us a, a situation where we've got to look for clever ways uh, to make sure that uh, we don't leave uh, some of our people behind. And that is why we've come up with programs where we are giving people money, especially in the informal settlements in urban areas. Mm -hmm. We're coming up with the arrangements where perhaps you've heard about uh, Kazim Tani. Yes, I, yeah. I actually heard about it in the budget. And yeah, super the Kazim. Billions have been allocated there. That's right. Yeah. And it, that is really a very sweet program mm. because you are using the youth within the informal settlements mm. and they are doing work with their hands. Mm. 
so that they can rehabilitate their environment. The roads. And, uh, the roads, uh, the water, sanitation, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the waste, mm. and make the place better. And they'll be proud Kenyans. Mm. Mm. And at the same time, you are giving them income. Mm. By the way, we are using technology in the way we are dealing with the youth. Okay. Why? The youth who are being employed are clocking in using technology. Wow. And they are being paid directly through the M-Pesa platform. Mm -hmm. Money is not passing through a middleman, mm -hmm. then another middle something, another mm -hmm. middle something. No. Directly to them. Directly to the person who is doing the work. Mm -hmm. And so this has been something that we say, look, uh, let us use technology, let us look at our environment and solve our own problem mm -hmm. without going out and crying out to other people. And this is our own innovative way mm. of dealing with this COVID situation. Mm. Now, there are many other things that we are doing at the moment yeah, to make sure that uh, the economy remains afloat. Mm. And then we support our people in the uh, agricultural sector and many other places. Mm. But now, specifically to the question you have asked about uh, business opportunities and the economy going forward, we are very, very cognizant of the need for a post-economic or post-COVID economic recovery. Mm. So that's a new program? That is a new program, and that is premised on the fact that every cloud has a silver lining. Mm. Yes. So we are saying that we should not waste a good crisis. Mm. We have, we have this <laughs> Please say that again. Please <laughs> we, say that. that, that that's a punchline. Don't yeah. waste a good, a good crisis. crisis. Yes, that's right. So we have got this emergency, we've got this pandemic mm. that uh, has come to us. But we are saying it is a good crisis because mm. it's giving us an opportunity for a paradigm shift mm. in the way we do our things. And therein is where then we are saying we must then kit our economy in terms of funding it in a way to make sure that we generate as much employment as possible. Mm -hmm. And that is premised on programs that are going to involve employing the youth mm. to do things using manual labor. So that we put people uh, at the forefront in doing work and also we put money in their pockets. Now we've come up with uh, what we're calling an economic stimulus package uh, which incorporates the uh, Kazim Tani where we mm. have allocated 10 billion Kenya shillings mm -hmm. and that program we hope will be able to employ over 200,000 wow. uh, youth around the country. Wow. Using your tax money, the, <laughs> the, the taxes that you pay, yes. we are making sure that they go to Kenyans who deserve it. Directly. Directly. And, and part of this will be also repairing um, roads uh, where they have been washed away, um, looking at um, a, a row, I mean, um, uh, pathways that uh, have also uh, not been uh, looked after for a long time. Mm -hmm. And there are many other programs within the economic stimulus, uh, touching on agriculture, touching, touching on education, touching on health, mm -hmm. uh, to make sure that we go to the people mm -hmm. and implement projects without waiting for a big institutional arrangement mm. yeah, so that we give employment to our youth. So right. that economic stimulus, uh, we are really very excited about it. First of July, we are going to roll it out. Wow, is that, that soon? That soon, okay. uh, because now the budgets are being um, taken through parliament, mm -hmm. and once parliament uh, appropriates the budget and tells mm -hmm. us now you can use this money, first of July, we'll just touch go and go. Wow. And, and implement wow. all those programs. Mm -hmm. wow. Now, in, in terms of then the bigger uh, aspect about business going forward, mm. we are very careful about making sure that we do not export employment. Mm. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to repeat that. We are very careful to make sure that we don't export employment by importing products and services that we could actually do them in mm -hmm. the country. Mm -hmm. And so there's going to be a big push in terms of manufacturing, doing value addition locally. Okay. There's going to be a big push about having services that previously you would have thought about uh, importing the services, but looking to empower our people mm. to be able to offer those services, mm. either to the public sector mm. or to the private sector. Mm. A major enabler, as I've said, and I want to repeat this again, is going to be technology. Technology. And that is why we have put a significant money into the Konza Technopolis. Yes. Uh, because uh, the Konza Technopolis is up and running. 
um, already the uh, headquarters mm. is uh, there mm. and um, uh, when you engage with the people who are running the concert technopolis they can mm. tell you the hope and the uh, promise mm. that that has in terms of uh, connectivity mm. and using technology mm. in this part of the world mm. we are also tying that by making sure that we empower the youth mm. by elevating the technical vocational education training mm. programs in terms of funding Mm. to make sure that we've got as many people trained at the technology level, mm. yeah, technician level, so that those ones can support now the people who are trained at engineering, okay. engineer level, mm. uh, because those technicians are the ones actually who create a lot of value. Mm. And that is where we are putting in a lot of money to mm. make sure that uh, we've got uh, a cohort mm. of uh, people, Kenyans, who can support SMEs. Mm. Uh, of course, the biggest uh, story is the um, three billion shillings that we have made available to set up a, a credit guarantee scheme to support uh, micro, small, and medium enterprises. Mm. Because the uh, micro and small enterprises, uh, they account for over 80% of all the employment, of all the production. And it is not just in Kenya, the world over. Yes. Yeah. So mm. the lesson here for us is... Um, we have gone down to the nitty gritty okay. yeah, to make sure that we, we support business bottoms up mm. yeah? so that then we have got uh, vibrant businesses at what politicians call grassroots level. <laughs> Mashinani, I, 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 I want to engage you further in this but time has run out but thank you. We have talked about uh, uh, Konza City. Actually we'll be having the CEO Dr. John Tanui He'll, 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 he'll dig deeper into the Konza city and how we can expect in this world of technology. But as we wrap up, because I'll be coming to you for any last words, Pastor Ambrose, uh, as, we, as we look into the future, um, I know businesses have gone through a hard time. What, what's your word to them as you as, as we also give your part in short? To the business people <coughs> here at Parklands uh, and also globally. Well, first is just to thank um, a lot of people who have really persevered. It's be, really been a time of endurance mm. and perseverance and, and, and a time of waiting. And I want to say continue being strong and courageous mm. because this season will not last. And yet, as we go through this season, we should come out the better for it. Mm. And God uses challenges in life to make us stronger and also to begin to make us to think differently. Mm. And it is my prayer that um, we will pray more, but also we'll be ready to do things in yeah. a different way. Because mm. when we pray, mm. God answers. Mm. When God answers, he gives us ideas. Mm. Are we ready to make those ideas begin to happen mm. in our lives? So mm. it just really continue to encourage a lot of people who have lost businesses, some who have been out of work. Mm. There are people who uh, have been pushed out of their houses because of rent issues. And as a church, mm. we have been preaching and giving hope and mm. strength because we believe mm. that God is not a man that he should lie. Mm. He's not a son of man that he should change his mind. Mm. Has he said, will he not do it? Mm. Has he spoken and will he not fulfill it? Mm. But God expects us to do our part because mm. he will do his part. We have to do and we part. have connect and do our part. Amen. And our part is to think differently. Yes. Any last word, Buona P.S.? Yes, well, this is... Um, Really exciting to, 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 to participate here. And thank you for coming. I know it's a busy season for you, very busy season for you. Thank you for coming. Right. So my last words, I will split them into different uh, groupings. First of all, to households, to individuals, mm. that there is hope. There is hope. Because uh, since the first case of COVID was diagnosed in Kenya, uh, we have been able to stay without a very steep rise mm. in the number of infections. And so in this pandemic, as we go through it, uh, we are looking at how we can restructure the way uh, people do their things so that as a government, we can support uh, our citizens, our people as much as possible. Mm. If you look at the side of business, I, I want to say the government is very clear in terms of supporting business. Uh, we have uh, provided money to pay most of the road uh, contractors mm. who were owed a lot of money. We are providing money to pay all and most of the pending bills mm. so that we can uh, put money into businesses. Mm. 
and also we are being careful about uh, supporting business going forward like I've talked about uh, micro and small and uh, medium enterprises mm -hmm. but let me also say as a government we are very clear uh, in terms of how we want to make sure that um, as we go through this crisis and look at uh, post uh, COVID recovery we rise from the ashes mm -hmm. like the Phoenix mm -hmm. and have even a more robust and a stronger economy mm -hmm. than before. So we are learning to ask ourselves, what are these big things that we can do? Mm -hmm. And the entrepreneurial spirit in Kenya is very strong. Mm -hmm. We are making the sanitizers here. Mm -hmm. We are manufacturing face masks. Mm -hmm. In fact, we have reached the point where we can manufacture for export. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there are, there are very many things that uh, now we are invoking our entrepreneurial and innovative spirit. Mm -hmm. and. I pray that business people will smell the coffee mm -hmm. yeah, and take the challenge mm -hmm. because government is there to support and offer opportunities to businesses Amen. in Kenya. Thank you. Thank you. There you have it. We have a PS, uh, National Treasury, Dr. Julius Muya. So we have the government and we have the church. We have heard from Reverend Ambrose Nangao, Senior Pastor, Park and Baptist Church. Uh, this is Paki Market Monday. We have been discussing the future of business, creating possibilities if you want the handout if you want uh, the recording for this so that we can di digest it pole pole slowly by slowly uh, please click there at parkland baptist church dot uh, org or parky virtual church dot org and you'll get the recording thank you gentlemen for coming you. we'll see you very soon next online we have the ceo of konza city dr Muya, you have talked about him uh, dr john uh, tanui will be coming to speak matters technology and how we can leverage uh, on this technology. So thank you and God bless you.